Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's In The Know podcast, where I'm joined by Phil Bray, founder and director of the Yardstick Agency, and they are a marketing agency specializing in financial services. Welcome. Good to see you, Phil. Thank you, James. Thank you for having me on. Good. So before we get into what is marketing and trying to decode and demystify uh, some of it, can you just give me a bit of background story of yourself and what led you into marketing? Uh, Sure. So I started in financial services way back in 1995. Um, We had three products then, a protection, a pension, and a PEP, if anybody remembers PEPs. Um, And I carried on advising. I became an IFA, as it was back then, um, and carried on until about 2008, 2009, something like that. Um, I then set up a business uh, called Investment Sense, which is now owned by my wife. Um, So she runs that, and my wife's a financial planner, and was head of marketing there for a few years, was head of marketing at the Sense Network for a couple of years, and then in 2016, had the idea of setting up what is now Yardstick, and we opened the doors, there was three of us at that point, opened the doors on the 10th of January 2017. Wow. Um, And since then, we've grown, there's 48, 49 of us now servicing financial advisors, financial planners um, in the UK and overseas as well. Excellent. And what led to the interest in marketing then? So I always enjoyed the, I always enjoyed the thrill of the phone ringing or the email pinging. Um, I was less keen on doing the work afterwards. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was always that thrill of creating something out of nothing and take a blog, for example, you start with a blank sheet of paper um, and maybe an idea if you're lucky. And after that, you end up with a, a piece of content that you can then go and promote. So for me, it was the, it was the thrill of taking action and then seeing the, um, the results of that. Uh, and as I ran a business, that was the thing I was interested in. The marketing aspect was the thing I was interested in. Um, let other people who were better than me do give it, deliver the advice. And what have you found most challenging setting up your own agency? Because that's that's quite a tough gig to do setting up your own business. So what have been what have been the trials and tribulations that you've been through? Um, I think there's two: balancing sales and operations, um, and making sure um, that delivery is as good as it possibly can be and as on point and as effective as it can be. Uh, We've not always got that right. Um, I don't think any agency has always got that 100% right. I think most marketing agencies will will try and balance those two things together. Um, So I think that's a challenge. Um, And it's a challenge we recognize and we a challenge that we, we try and rise to. I think the other challenge is people. And making sure that you've got the right people in your team. Uh, and it took a couple of years, maybe a little bit longer actually, to understand who we needed in the team, what sort of people were, were right for Yardstick, who were the who were what we call Yardstick people. And I very much see us as a business. Up until COVID, we were one business. Um, so this time, maybe four years ago, uh, we were one business. And then we changed dramatically from kind of March 2020 onwards um, and definitely went into a, a second second phase. Okay. And tell me a bit more about that second phase then. What does that look like? So I think up in the first three years, um, up until lockdown, we were very much a Nottingham-based business. So I'm in the, our office now in Nottingham. We were very much in a Nottingham-based business pretty much everybody worked from the office. And that, as you'll know, brought re- recruitment challenges. Um, you were fishing for your recruits in a relatively small pool. COVID taught us that actually the team can function effectively working remotely. You can create a really positive culture in the business despite people working remotely. And that meant we could expand more quickly because the pool in which we were uh, recruiting from became significantly, significantly bigger. 
So that was a massive change for us. Um, just being able to fish in a, in a bigger pool for recruits. I think the other thing that changed is we became a effectively a hybrid or even remote business. So whilst we're in the, we've got maybe 1,400 square foot here in Nottingham, uh, and we're right in the centre of Nottingham, so it is a nice place to, to work. We have people who have never been to the office or have maybe been to the office a couple of times each year when we get everyone together to you know, social social uh, events. So for me, I think the biggest change was just the fact that we recognised we could build a business, we could build the culture of the business, and we could maybe move a little bit quicker than we otherwise would have done because we were recruiting from a, a larger pool of people. So that's, that's interesting because I speak to a lot of people about culture and it's quite subjective uh, how to build a culture, even more so if you are hybrid or remote. So just touching on that, how have you managed to build a culture when you're effectively working remotely? What's, what's the, the secret to that success? I think it's, it's making sure people feel connected to members of their team, and we're divided into maybe five or six different teams. So it's making sure people feel connected to their team. It's making people feel um, that they are part of a bigger endeavor. Practically speaking, we I think it's about communication. Um, we use Slack to communicate, as you would expect as a, as a business. But it's also for us about then recognizing the style of communication. So should we be writing this? Should we be having a conversation? Should we be meeting up online? There are multiple meetings during the week where we get the teams together uh, on Zoom calls and on meetings such as like we're on right now for those that are watching. Um, so, for example, the content team will meet together every two weeks on a Monday morning, uh, a couple of hours, and that's the, that's the whole team. We have a weekly parish meeting where the whole team get together. Uh, we share um, parish news, things that are going on in the business. Mm -hmm. We share good news. There's often a little presentation from different team members. Um, and we deliver our weekly uh, QDOS survey results, uh, which is employee of the week, but we call it uh, QDOS. So we, uh, we deliver the winner and let them choose their prize. We do uh, pretty regular um, quizzes on a Friday night online. And then two or three times a year, we pay for everybody in the company to come to Nottingham. Uh, get them down for a couple of days and organize some fun activities and generally finishes in the pub at night. So there's all sorts of things. But for me, it's about communication. It's about understanding that people are feel, going to feel isolated. Um, and the other thing we've got uh, is a therapist on retainer. So you have to have a therapist on retainer um, that the team can go and book sessions with. There's no limit on the number of sessions that they can book. Um, there's none of this NHS, you've got to get your mental health problems sorted out in six weeks, otherwise you're, you're finished with us. Um, so they can book as many sessions with the therapist as they like. Um, they take comp on, on company time if they want. Um, and we also make the therapist available to their partner or spouse as well. Um, so we do that, and that helps company culture as well. Yeah, that's very good, and that's part of the employee value proposition. Um, and forgive me, my marketing is close to my heart because I run a business anyway. Um, but the people that you work with, would I be wrong in thinking they're all young or hip, groovy beards, nice hair? Am I wrong in that? Because obviously financial services is heavily regulated, et cetera. So you've, helped, you've obviously had to bring in the right people. But my impression is it's all very, very hip, very hipster. Is that right or am I off the mark? Um. Basically, you're asking me to say whether our staff are hip or not, aren't they? Yeah, sure I <laughs> are they them. cool and groovy? Yeah, yeah I'm not sure I can win that. Um, so we have a real age range in the business. Um, I would say that the average age of people at Yardstick is 30 to 32, something like that. Uh, we have plenty of people in their, in their 20s. Uh, there's quite a few of us in our 50s as well. Um, so it's a, real, it's a real age range. Um, but are they hip? I'll let you ask them that. 
yeah, subjective, isn't it? Yeah, it is rather. Yeah, a- anyone's hip to me these days. Okay, well, thanks for that, and thanks for a bit of background. Um, let's now sort of turn into marketing then, because this is you know um, certainly important. It's very prevalent, um, and there's lots going on. It's, a, it's very much a golden time to be a financial planner. Um, but I also think that some people can get lost with marketing. So for the first question I've got is, in its purest sense, what is marketing? I think that depends on what you're trying to achieve. I know we all have binary answers, but it depends is sometimes the right answer. Uh, For the majority of the clients we work with, and 80% of our clients are financial advisors and planners. The other 20% provide services into those financial advisors and planners. Um, it's generally about supporting their business ambitions. So, for example, uh, this afternoon, I was meeting with a firm, and they want to take on 50, 5 zero, new clients a year. So that's their business ambition. Their marketing needs to support that business ambition and deliver the right number of inquiries so they take on those those clients. So for me, marketing is there to support the business's ambitions, whatever they whatever they are. And That then gives way, in my head at least, um, into sales. So where's that line between sales and and marketing? And for me, marketing creates the opportunity. Sales turns that opportunity into cash. That view is challenged to to a degree by something like um, Marcus Sheridan's They Ask, You Answer where he talks about the fact that 70% of the buying decision, in this case, whether to engage a particular financial planner, is made before the prospect, before the consumer, actually meets anybody within the business. So if that's true, then the lines between marketing and sales become really blurred. Uh, But at a headline level, I think for me, marketing is creating the opportunity. Sales is turning that opportunity into turnover, revenue, but the lines are becoming more blurred. So once you've identified what the objectives are, there are different types of marketing, whether that's online, newsletters, uh, using different platforms, LinkedIn, etc. Can you just talk through some of the sort of the different types of marketing that you know is available to advisors and probably break it down into which ones are the main ones. Okay, fine. Um, So for me, there's there's a couple of ways of looking at this. You can look at this along the lines of, well, there's inbound marketing and there's outbound marketing. So inbound marketing being putting really good quality content out um, into the, the world, promoting that content really hard. Um, and then waiting for the phone to ring and the email to ping. And inbound marketing has huge, huge advantages to it. Contrast that with outbound marketing. There's a place for both. Outbound marketing would be uh, picking up the phone, smiling as you're dialing, that sort of of stuff. Back to my first, one of my first jobs ever in telesales. 95, you'd walk in, pull off the other pages and start dialing. That was, that was good. Um, but for me, we've got to think about inbound versus outbound marketing. And pretty much you can categorize things in either of those counts. But what I would say is there are, if we're thinking about a tactical level, there are, for me, a bunch of marketing foundations that all advice and planning firms need to get right. They really need to get those foundations right. And that's looking at things such as that online presence and understanding how impressive they are 
when someone takes that digital journey to your door. And that digital journey includes people who have referred to you by an ingle, referred to the financial advisor by an existing client or professional connection. It could be somebody who has just driven past your office. It could be someone who's seen something on social media. But everyone takes that digital journey. Yeah, once they become aware of a financial advisor, perhaps because they've been recommended, then they will search them online, they will look them up, they'll compare them to other options. There'll be mentally a little scorecard in their head about which is the right planner for me. Is it firm A or firm B? So I think we've got to get the foundations right, which is around online presence, which is around social proof, showing the value of working with you rather than just telling. Um, and that's things like online ratings and reviews, client surveys, client videos. So get the foundations right. And then in terms of tactics that will actually generate new inquiries, for me, if you imagine a long list of all the tactics that could generate new inquiries, referrals and recommendations from existing clients should be number one, always number one. Um, and that's because referrals and recommendations from existing clients have got the lowest cost of acquisition and the highest conversion rate. So logically in my head, why would you start anywhere else? Let's get that nailed first of all, and then we can look at other, other tactics. But most advisors, most planners have no recommendation strategy in place at all. Um, there's research from Vouched for that shows 85% of advised clients have never been asked by their advisor for a referral. Wow. So if the advisor's not doing that basic thing, they certainly don't have a holistic strategy in place to generate referrals. So for me, referrals and recommendations and having a defined strategy in place that's centered around client communication, client appreciation, and client education. And once you've done that, then it's time to have a think, well, if we need this many new inquiries to achieve our goal and we can get this many through referrals and recommendations, what do we then bridge the gap with? Long-winded answer, James, to a short question. Sorry. No, it's interesting. I think... That takes us quite nicely on to um, some of the myths and misconceptions that we spoke beforehand anyway. And I will say, um, you know, running a business whereby I have people, lots of people contacting me, I very rarely get any financial planners contacting my business to say, do you need any key man? Do you need any help? Do you need any sort of extraction of cash? apart from one very large, shiny firm that always send me a very nice letter. Um, I'm sure we can guess who, the, who they are. But, I, but on the flip side, I do get lots of solicitors and lots of accountants calling me or emailing me, but it never seems to be financial planners. So I thought that's quite a nice segue now into sort of some of the, the myths and misconceptions about marketing and generating business. I think you've just given a lot of people permission to get in touch with you, James, to find out if you've got any key managers. It's fine. It's all right. I, I have. I have a good financial advisor, a chartered <laughs> fellow. <laughs> Nothing to see here. Move on. <laughs> yeah, don't bother. Yeah. <laughs> um, so in terms of myths, myths and misconceptions, um, we took a lot of yardstick about myths, misconceptions, and limiting beliefs. And all of them, that advisors hold will damage their marketing in some way, shape, or form. Take, for example, social proof. Often we'll talk about the importance of client videos and getting your clients on video in front of a camera, either recorded remotely or on a face-to-face -face shoot. Um, to talk about the value of working with a financial planner. And we're not interested in numbers. We're not interested in you know, the returns that the financial planner has, has achieved for them. We're interested in the journey, how they feel about the future, what's changed because they work with the financial planner, et cetera, et cetera. And when you first pitch this idea to a lot of business owners, a lot of financial planners, you often end up with a little financial planner-shaped hole in the wall as they try and run through the wall because they'd rather do anything than ask their clients to appear on video. 
And it even gets to the point when a lot of them will, a lot of the advisors will just say, no, dismiss it out of hand. My clients will not do that. Why, why, why is what? that, Phil? Yeah. What, it's, the no, it's the next question. Why? Why are they different? They're not. You know that and I know that, but they're, they're, they're not. Um, and why, is, why does it happen? Um, I think there's a few reasons potentially. The first is just gut feel. I don't think my clients are going to do that. Well, let's open our mind a little bit and just ask them and follow some evidence because we wouldn't be suggesting it if we didn't think it was going to be, it's going to work. Um, think again, advisors just not wanting to put themselves out of the comfort zone and actually asking the uh, clients to appear on video. So I think it's fear. Um, I think it's fear the reasons they, they won't do it. But in our view, if you ask the right clients in the right way, they will absolutely be prepared to uh, appear on video. And a little story to show actually how willing some clients are to do it, or two stories maybe. Uh, the first, uh, we did a set of videos for Lloyd French at the Lawney Well. They're on his website. If anybody wants to go and have a look at them. And not only did we record the videos face to face, Lloyd's clients were happy to let us go into their home, or in one case, their place of work, to record the videos. So that's a step up. Yeah? Mm. One step, asking them to record them remotely, another to do it in maybe the client's office, the advisor's office. Another way we actually go into the client's homes to do it. Um, and then I can think of another one where we were uh, recording in Henwood Court's office, um, Nick Platt at Henwood Court in Sutton Coalfield. And it was a December morning, December 22. It was still dark when we got there to set up the shoot. First client came in, and I was just making a bit of small talk with the client while the film crew were finishing off. Just said to the client, thank you for uh, coming to do this. Really appreciate it. Have you come far? He said, yeah, I come from Wales, which is about a 90-minute trip there and a 90-minute trip back. So I said, thank you for doing it. Really grateful. And his words, he said, I'm here because I want to say thank you to Nick. It's my way of saying thank you to Nick. Working with Nick has changed my life. So for me, it's about reframing this. If you ask the right clients in the right way, they will do it because it's their way of saying thank you to the advisor. That's a really good story, that. And, you know, I'm aware of Nick and I can see him on LinkedIn. He's been very prevalent in doing that. Just, just to take it back a step in terms of the, the fear factor um, and the reticence to, to, to ask clients, do you, do you think sometimes marketing gets lumped into almost sales and therefore maybe sales has been almost like a dirty word within financial services within the regulated market because it was almost seen back in the day when we tried to shift away from commission that sales was a bad thing. So I guess my question is, do you think we've sort of conditioned people to think that, you know, selling, sales, marketing is perhaps beneath them a little bit, maybe not required? I think potentially, potentially, certainly on the marketing side. Um, every so often I'll put something out on Twitter or LinkedIn that basically says, look, everyone's selling something, yeah? Those solicitors or accountants that contact you, James, they're selling something, professional services. Um, we're selling something. Financial advisors are selling something. So we're all selling something. I think we've got to recognise that. Um, but I think there's maybe, there's maybe some advisors, planners, business owners who have a fear of, marketing in 2024 are potentially worried about getting it wrong, still think the way it was done 20 years ago is the way it's done right now. Um, so take how some advisors feel about something as mundane as Google reviews. So Google reviews are important because when someone runs a search for a business's name, what we would call a brand search, the Google reviews pop up on the right-hand side. You've got the Google business listing, the reviews are on there. So it's a great way to make a fantastic first impression. There's other things you can do with the reviews as well, but it's a great way to make a fantastic first impression. And I've had advisors tell me, 
Google reviews aren't right for my clients because they're high net worth. There's no research to back it up. It's just gut feel. I've advisors tell me, well, we've used, Google reviews can be faked. So what's the point? Well, a £20 note can be faked, but you, the pub's still going to take it. When do you go and buy your pint? Um, I've had other advisors tell me it's just too hard to get Google reviews. My clients won't give me Google reviews. But you know what? All of that's wrong. They absolutely, absolutely will. So it's back to that myths and misconceptions. But to answer your point, I think, what do people think sales is a dirty word? I actually don't think they do. I think sometimes they think marketing is a little bit grubby. Okay. And you've, you've, you've named, you know, some success, success stories. What other elements are advisors missing out on if they're not using marketing tools which are available? Um, I think marketing firms of a certain size, um, well, every business needs people, doesn't it? Uh, every business needs people. And businesses of a certain size need got greater recruitment needs than smaller businesses potential. And I think a lot of firms miss out on the synergies between recruitment and marketing and feel that they never think about how marketing can support their recruitment efforts. So, for example, we talk to firms of the right size about things such as Glassdoor. Um, we've put a lot of effort at Yardstick into Glassdoor. We try and encourage um, firms of a certain size to do the same thing because we know a lot of recruits, potential recruits, will go and look at Glassdoor. I think... Recruits are, you'll tell me, but the financial services recruitment marketplace seems pretty competitive right now. Um, with candidates, as I understand it, having a few options, uh, especially power planners and well-trained advisors. So they almost want the same social proof the clients, potential clients want. That is this firm a good place? Is the firm looking after clients well? And will that firm look after look after me. So I think a lot of firms forget that social proof extends past impressing potential clients and should impress potential candidates as well. But you know more about that than me. Yeah, well, just to touch on that, I think it is a very, very competitive market out there. And I see the firms that do well, it's because they found their tone of voice and it resonates with people. And I think where firms go wrong is where they just would put a job advert, which is a job description online. That isn't showing anybody, your company, what you do. So I think social proof can expand on that. So if you have videos of your team, if you have Glassdoor, if you have Google reviews, if you have a clear proposition, it's everything. People will buy into that. And I think you need to have a very authentic tone of voice, which resonates across your business. Um, but I don't think people do enough of it. And I think they miss out on some fantastic people as well. I 100% agree. And um, I think that nail on the head about um, the difference between a job description and a job advert. A um, number of firms I see, like well, we've got a job description, let's put that up on LinkedIn or Indeed or, or wherever. Um, and actually it's a boring, dry job description that's not going to sell the vacancy to anybody. Yeah. Um, and it's back to that word selling, isn't it? Everybody's selling something. In that case, the firm is selling a position that they want to fill. Yeah, and it's an art form, um, and it's a skill that needs to be refined. So with Yardstick, then, how do you support advisors? Because before I took on a marketing manager here, um, marketing sort of used to fall on my shoulders, and it on S, any SME, it'll be quite difficult because ultimately you have an idea and then you need to think about the, the, the audience and then the content and then the follow-up. And then before you know it, you think, oh my God, I've spent two hours doing this when I could be doing something else. Um, and I think many business owners feel the same. It's like, where do you start? Um, and we have tried before to outsource it, um, but I've always found you need people who know the subject matter inside out. I think that's really important. But how can how could Yardstick support 
And what do you do to support the advisory community? Okay. So there's there's two ways of working with us. And I, I find there's probably two ways of answering this. Explaining how we work with individual clients and then explaining how we support the advisory community. Um, so there's two ways of working with us. First way of working with the ISTIC is what we would call the execution only approach. Well, we call it execution only because advisors, planners understand what that means. And it means that the advice firm are coming to us and saying, Yardstick, can you do X, Y, or Z? Because we don't have the time, skill, or inclination to do it ourselves. And providing we agree with them that it's the right thing to do, we'll then happily implement. To take that execution-only analogy a bit further, we won't work with insistent clients because why would we take money off a firm for something we know won't work? So in that case, we'd explain to them why it won't work and then make some suggested alternatives. But that execution-only approach works when the advice firm knows what they want to do and just don't have the time, skill, or inclination to do it themselves. And that word gets spread across our different departments. We've got a digital team who build websites. We've got a content team who write blogs, news articles, newsletters, award entries, press releases, all that sort of stuff. And a social media team who manage client social media profiles. Uh, we have a branding team who we do everything from a, a naming to a pull-up banner. And then we have a client success team who help our clients run webinars, run client video projects, client surveys, that sort of stuff. So that's the first way, execute Stanley. The second way of working with us is more strategic. So um, this is designed to mirror the financial planning process and produces, rather than a financial plan, a marketing strategy for the business. And there's three stages to it, discovery, presentation, and then implementation. And that's where that strategy process works when firms know what they want to achieve. So it's going back to the business uh, marketing, supporting the business. So when a firm knows what they want to achieve, but don't know how to go and do it, we will write a marketing plan to show them how to do it. In the same way, they might write a financial plan for their client who knows that they want to retire at a certain point with a certain lifestyle, but don't know how to achieve it. So those are the two ways of working with us. Execution only or writing a marketing strategy. And do you get involved in um, helping and, and designing the proposition? Because if you've got a, a proposition which they want to take to their clients, do you help sort of understand what that proposition lo looks like, how it could be articulated, how it could be communicated to generate the, the right interest? So do you look at that side as well? Absolutely. Um, couple of occasions when we do that quite significantly, new start firms, uh, where they're trying to decide, well, what's our price? What's our proposition? Uh, what are we offering to clients at, at what cost? Then also do it when firms want to target a different demographic. So, for example, um, I wrote a note to a client last week where they want to, they're very aware that their client bank is getting older. Um, that clearly will, over time, diminish the value of the business. So they want to look at how they can take on a younger demographic. Now, if their average age of the client is 65 and they want to take on a younger demographic of people in their 30s and early 40s, people in their 30s and early 40s have different financial concerns and ambitions to the generation that is older. They also may want to pay for the fees in a different way. And they probably will have accumulated a lower value of assets. So ad valorem charging, percentage-based charging won't work. So that's a good example of where you actually really need a different pricing, different proposition, different model for a younger, a younger generation. So again, long-winded answer to a short, short question, James. But yes, we do get involved in that sort of stuff. No, it's interesting because I was having a, a conversation with somebody and we were talking about the wealth transfer. And it was in this Schroeder's report that 69% of advisors were concerned about wealth transfer in terms of they weren't tapping into it. So they were dealing with one particular spouse 
um, and not dealing with the other one or the wider family. So I guess this is an area that you could support advisors that are looking to bridge that gap into expanding to new markets, bearing in mind there's a different demographic. Absolutely. And I think there's, there's two different challenges there. Um, there's spousal inheritance, um, and then there's the inheritance going to the children. Um, and the spousal inheritance is often a trigger for the surviving spouse, especially if the surviving spouse is a widow, to consider changing advisor. Um, it's quite usual for the widow to think, like, right, now I am going to work with somebody different because perhaps the advisor they were working beforehand had a closer, better relationship with the, the husband. So, But the assets, the investable assets, will probably remain invested to provide an income or cover care costs, that sort of stuff. So that's one version of it. The second version, of course, is when the money cascades down to the generation below. Um, and again, that's very different because it's potentially harder to build a relationship with the, the children. And also the children have got different needs. Um, if you inherit money right now and you've got a mortgage paying 5 or 6%, you might be really tempted to pay, pay that off rather than continue to, for the money to remain invested. So I think there's different challenges with wealth transfer depending on cost, whether it's going across the generations or down the generations. Yeah. Okay. And just going back to myths and misconceptions, um, using social media, Twitter, X, whatever it's called these days, I don't see too many advisors on there. I would assume for regulatory concerns, if they say something which could be advice, et cetera. But do you advocate people use the social media platforms or steer clear? So, it, can, it can be a cesspit, I have to say. It's, it's dreadful on there, but it's also a good uh, communication tool. Following the wrong people, James. <laughs> I am. Well, well, on X, use the um, never go on the For You feed. That's where the real cesspit stuff goes. It's, yeah. Yeah, it's where to find me. Yeah, create some lists or something like that. <laughs> so should people use social media? Um I think if you're going to use social media for business purposes, you've really got to have, unless you're just doing it for enjoyment, yeah, enjoyment or, who knows, ego. Um, if you're using it for one of those two things, then just crack on. But actually, if you want to use it to grow your business, I think you've got to understand and have a clear vision of what you want to achieve. Um, so think about, is this about profile? Is it about new client generation? Is it about um, potential recruitment challenges? Is it about um, linking out to other firms who you could potentially acquire or you could be acquired by? So what is it you want to use social media for? And once you've understood that, that will then tell you which platform to go and use. So, for example, let's say uh, you've got a firm targeting... Um, reasonably high-earning accumulators in their 40s who work in the creative sector. Then LinkedIn's potentially a place for that. Instagram's potentially a place for that. If you want to target the generation above, maybe their parents, people in the glide path to retirement, at retirement, or in that first active phase of retirement, then Facebook might be a better place. So start thinking about what you want to achieve and then where do the people you want to achieve that objective with hang out? And then go and hang out there. Don't go and hang out on Twitter and X if all the people you want to deal with are on Instagram. Yeah? You've got to go to them. You can't go and expect them to come to you. And then for me, it's all about adding value. Too many people hit social media, start arguing with each other, boasting, humble brags, look at me. You've just got to be adding value all the time. Every single thing that you put up there, almost every single thing you put up there, has got to be adding value. And there's no shortage of inspiration uh, for those sort of value-added posts. I think you can insert, if you're doing that, you can insert um, some personal posts, some humble brags. Um, 
probably kind of on an 8 1 1 ratio. For every 10 posts, eight should add value. One should be a bit more personal about you. And one should be just add this great vouch for you. That sort of that sort of stuff. But I think you've got to be adding value most of the time. And the other thing, you've got to be consistent. Show up on a regular basis. Yeah, I totally agree with that. What's what's your view on the personalization of posts? Because people talk about being authentic, being real, being genuine. And you often find on LinkedIn that people are posting quite personal posts about them. Where do you stand on that when you talk about adding value and maybe that sort of 811 ratio? Are you an advocate of sharing all or, or not in financial services? I think you I think you share as much as somebody individually feels comfortable sharing. Um I wouldn't be sharing things that you felt uncomfortable with just for engagement. Um, I would just share what you feel comfortable with. Um, like you say, be authentic, but share what you feel comfortable with. Don't go past that line just for the likes or the engagement. Yeah. Yeah, that's good advice. And just going back to the social proof, we've obviously covered that. Um, but I guess from my perspective, I would I would challenge you to say, well, I understand that referrals recommendations people demonstrating that the service that they've had i get that but is there any sort of scientific evidence to back that up that actually that does work so social proof is a term but actually it's born out of evidence-based science to say that it does work so there is um, evidence and anecdotes um so if you look at um this uh a couple of blogs on our website about this um, I think it's data-driven reasons why you should be collecting social social proof. And there was research to show that over 80% of people searching for a local service will look at Google reviews. Um, if you go and look at Vouched for, Vouched for got some tremendous evidence to show the value of reviews on there. So that's kind of the evidence. Anecdotally, um, from a recruitment perspective, whenever we interview somebody here at Yardstick, we'll ask them if you looked at our glass door reviews, and they'll always say yes, and they'll reference some of them. Um, more anecdotes from a Google review perspective. Um, I put this out on Twitter and LinkedIn maybe Tuesday this week, and it was an advisor who messaged me and said, uh, Google reviews work. Uh, just had a lead in. We're further away than the other advisors they were considering, but our reviews were better, so she chose us. Yeah. So evidence and anecdotes. This Brilliant. sort of stuff. This sort of stuff works. It's, it it's important. It really is important. Okay. So sort of final question then. So uh let's assume I'm an IFA. I'm listening to this thinking, okay, I need to to do something. And let's, for the sake of argument, say they're not going to engage with you just yet, but there's certain things that they need to do what would be the top three things you would advocate and advise an advisor to do from tomorrow? First thing, um, walk in a prospect's shoes. So imagine that they have been referred and recommended to their own firm and search for the firm online, search the individual advisor's name online. How impressive are they? Yeah, Would they be... Um, would they be impressed? Look at it dispassionately. Would they be impressed by what the prospect sees on that Google search results page when they Google the firm, the uh, advisor's firm name or their individual name? So that's the first thing. Take that digital journey. Click a few links. Go and look at the website and look dispassionately. Would I be impressed? And are there other firms who would potentially be more impressive? So I think that's the that's the first thing. The second thing is about looking after your existing clients, making sure you're communicating on a regular basis with existing clients. Monthly newsletters, so important. Quarterly newsletters are just a cop-out for people who don't understand the value of newsletters. Um, so monthly newsletters. I consider other ways, other touch points. Webinars, for example, client events. But just making sure that the communications schedule, communications diary with clients, existing clients, is effective. 
And then the third thing is around referrals and recommendations from existing clients. People need to understand that you will get referrals and recommendations from existing clients by being passive and doing nothing. But you'll get more, potentially better quality with more of the right type of people if you have a strategy that is horrible word, but it's holistic and, and is based on educating clients, communicating with clients, and appreciating them when they recommend on. So I think for me, there's three things there. There's the digital journey. There's the communications with existing clients. And then referrals and recommendations. So really good advice there. And when you say quarterly newsletters are a cop-out, monthly is obviously the way to go. What do advisors write on a monthly basis? Where do they get the content from? And what does their audience actually find interesting sorry loaded question there but i'm just thinking if i was doing a monthly newsletter what would i actually write on a monthly basis so um let's deal with that the inspiration the ideation where that where that comes from um, and it comes from your everyday life so again if you read um they ask you answer marcus sheridan or show your work by austin cleon and um, you'll be in no doubt as to where you get inspiration from. And one of the simple things to do is every time a client, a prospect, a professional connection asks you a question, write it down. Because the answer that you give is either a social post or a, or a blog. So that's one way that advisors can find that constant stream of ideas to be writing about. Just write down the questions that you get asked. Dead straightforward. Uh, there's various websites as well that will help you uh, find questions that people are interested in answering about money. Next thing I'd do is just expand horizons a little bit and write about things that aren't just about money, investment, pensions, that sort of stuff. Write lifestyle pieces. Now, we're not suggesting that um, an advisor would go and try and turn their website or their newsletter into Tatler or GQ or Vanity Fair or something like that by writing lifestyle articles. But um, 10 podcasts our team are listening to right now. Yeah. Um, 10 bucket list destinations our clients have ticked off this year. 10 pubs to go and visit in Nottingham, that sort of stuff. That gets huge traction and gives people another reason to open newsletters and read them. Yeah. Um, and then the third type of content, if you've got the sign of advice, financial advice, financial planning, investment stuff, lifestyle, is content about the firm, comings and goings at the firm, things that are happening in the business. They generally get really good open rates as well. So if advisors know where to look and kind of have their radar switched on, there's no shortage of no shortage of content. And chat GPT. People using that more these days to help with content creation? I think it helps. Um, I think there's, there's essentially four stages to producing content. Ideation, writing, editing, and proofing. The, the four stages, and they're distinct phases. And ideally, you shouldn't combine them or merge them together. So ChatGPT might help with ideation. Might help with you editing. It probably doesn't help too much with proofing, but other tech, other things do. So uh, Microsoft Word has a read aloud function. Almost nobody knows about it. Hmm. And if you get, if you've written it, uh, you've written your piece, whatever it is, whether it's a social post or a blog, and you get Microsoft Word to read it aloud to you, you, it's amazing how much it tightens up your writing. It's just astonishing how good it is at helping you edit a piece and tighten up the writing. So I think ChatGPT has a place, to put, uh, place but it's never going to capture. Well, that's not true. It, right now, it doesn't <laughs> capture your authentic voice. It can be fantastic and can help, but it doesn't capture authentic voice right now yeah still needs to be driven by us it does and i'll i'll, I'll use it for certain things 
Yeah. Um, I put up a, a poll on LinkedIn this morning and I was really struggling with how I get this within a certain word count. I was over the word count. So I just put it into chat GPT and said, just reduce this. Yep. Give me this in however many characters I'm allowed, 140. And it did it. It was really useful. Um, but I don't think it necessarily, it augments and helps the writing process. It doesn't replace the writer. And before we top out, because um, we're heading towards the hour now, any future trends to be looking out for from a marketing perspective? Yes, I think there's, there's always things that are changing. There's always um, advances. A lot of them creep up on you, I think. Yeah? Um, you don't necessarily see them until you've used them for a while. But I think for me, whilst we always need to be looking forward, we, just, we also need to get the basics right as well. Um, and there's so many firms out there right now that just don't get the basics right. And I know it's dull. And I know people want to be attracted by shiny new things. And we need to avoid being magpie marketers. We need to get the basics right. And some of those we've described already. Magpie marketers. That's going in the thumbnail. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. Um, well, thank you very much, Phil, for today anyway. Really enjoyed this conversation. Uh, where do people find you if they want to make contact with you? Uh, the Arctic Agency uk uh, is our website, but actually, don't do that. Just write the Arctic Agency into Google because then you'll see our 151 five star <laughs> Google reviews. That's brilliant. Many thanks for today. Appreciate thanks it. Thanks for having me on, James. Cheers. Cheers.